beautiful truths on a beautiful day, singing songs about our Savior. Would you pray with me? Father, pray that you would help me to focus, to accurately and faithfully communicate your word to your people. Lord, that you would let me preach Christ. That you would be honored. And that we would be changed. Holy Spirit, have your perfect work in and through me and through your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The title of the message this afternoon is called Living the Resurrection. Living the Resurrection. The resurrection has significant implications for our day-to-day -day life. It is not just merely something that we look forward to or something that we look back on, but it is something that should that should hold our thoughts and our actions and our words every moment of every day. Turn with me, if you would, to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. You'll note, as you recall, in chapter 1, verse 27, there's that push for unity. He's saying that we need to be a church that is unified. You Philippians need to be unified. And then he talks about in chapter 2, he says if there's any encouragement in Christ, that we are to make his joy complete by being of the same mind. We're to have fellowship in the Spirit. We are to be a people marked by humility. Because a people marked by humility represent and give glory to God because Christ was our example in that. Yet he was rich for our sake. He became poor. He, creator, sustainer of heaven and earth, stepped off of his throne, took on flesh, never ceased to be what he was, but took on what he was not and humbled himself to the nth degree, even to death on a cross. And you have these Judaizers coming in to Philippi and trying to bring in things that are opposed to the gospel. Trying to say, that's great, you have your faith in Christ, but there's some things that you can't forget. You have to abstain from certain foods. You can't eat certain foods. There's some, some things you have to do. You'll have to be circumcised. You have to proselytize yourself into Judaism and then travel through Judaism into Christianity. And Paul explains why if that were true, he would be the greatest Judeo-Christian individual there ever was. Look at verse 1 of chapter 3. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing again is no trouble for me, and it's a safeguard to you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Isn't that interesting? You know, at a time like today, isn't it interesting that Paul calls those Jewish people that he calls them dogs, which was normally a term reserved for Gentiles. And he calls them, the false circumcision, he calls them mutilators. And then he goes on in verse 3 and says, For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and in the glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. 
as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. So Paul lays out his pedigree here and says, if there was going to be righteousness achieved through law keeping, I would have had that. He was far and far more zealous than any of his countrymen. And if there was going to be any hope to find this righteousness through the law, which it was never intended to do, Paul would have had it. It's not often that Paul goes into detail talking about himself. Normally, he's more content on encouraging and building up and having everyone look at Christ. And while it may seem like Paul is trying to grab attention to himself here, what I want you to notice as we look in a little more deeply into verses 7 through 11, that Christ is referred to ten times in this short section. Ten times in this short section. Christ is the focus of the passage, and Paul is using this example of himself to show that they, they're here. If there was going to be anyone that was going to be saved through law keeping, it would have been me. But notice what I do. Notice what I have done. Notice what I am doing. Notice what I look forward to. Let's read verses 7 through 11. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Let's just walk through phrase by phrase as I want to point some of these glorious truths out to you. Let's look at verse 7. He says, he starts with this strong contrast, but he's contrasting what he's just stated, the confidence in the flesh that he would have had. If there was righteousness to be found in the law, he would have been blameless. But he's shifting this. And he says, whatever things... He's saying, those things, these things that were referred to here in verses 4 to 6. But then it's more than that, isn't it? Because he doesn't just say those things. He says, whatever things, whatever things that were gained to me, I've counted as loss. Those things and everything else. Now, I want to get into the, to the weeds a little bit here to help bring out what's going on. Because there's a lot of repetition. But there's actually strong contrasts within this repetition. When he says were, whatever things were gained to me, he's saying this was the, these were the things that were continuously gained to me. Day in and day out. Continual, durative gain for me. And these, are, these are accounting terms. Profit and loss. And although you, you can't see it here in the English, gain is actually gains. It's plural, and loss is singular. And this, this gain, this profit, is the same word that you see in Philippians 1.21. For me, to live is Christ, and to die is profit. Profit. Now, before we go any further, just so that we can make sure that as we're listening to this and as we're working through this, that we're examining our own hearts. Do you still see the things of this earth as profit? Are you putting your hope, maybe not necessarily for salvation, but for your day to day? Are you putting those things in things of the earth? Or is, is death your prophet. Not in some sadistic way where you're going to try to commit suicide or anything like that, 
but that you know that when death comes, it's glory. That you're so heavenly minded that you think this is profit. This is what I long for. Oh, death, where is your sting? Death has been swallowed up in victory by Christ Jesus. So if I'm going to live, I'm going to live for Christ. And if I'm going to die, I'm going to be with Christ from faith to sight. And so what is there that can separate me from the love of Christ? Therefore, I will press on all the more and live for him. Nevertheless, Paul says, whatever things that were continually a gain to me, those things that were advantages of mine, those things, those things that were profits, I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Now you remember on Friday we, we got a little nerdy and we talked about the perfect verb, the perfective aspect, an action that happened in the past. But effects are continuing up until the present. And that's the way Paul is using that here. I have counted. He's given careful consideration at that time and saying that those effects still continue. Now, Paul's talking about his conversion here. He's talking about something that happened in the past. This is 30 years ago now. And he says that they were loss. So all the prophets, all those things, P-R-O-F-I-T-S, not those who foretell, but gains, increases, profit and loss, accounting terms, all of those things that he thought were advantageous to him are actually harmful. They're hindrances. Look with me in Acts 27, 18. Acts 27, 18. Paul is on the ship. He's about to be shipwrecked. Acts 27, 18. The next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small storm was assailing us, from then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. When they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not set sail to Crete and incurred this damage and loss. There's our same word. Loss. How did, how did these, these soldiers and these shipmates, how did they look at all of this precious cargo? Well, they abandoned it. They abandoned it all so that they might at least have the opportunity to escape with their lives. And that's what Paul is talking about here. All that was considered a prophet is actually really a loss. Paul envisions himself as, as a man of business, as, as an accountant. And what he's doing here is he's opening up the ledger of his life before the Philippians. And he's looking through and it's as if, all of his life was, was in the black. I mean, we know what that means. Black Friday. Black Friday is called Black Friday because that's when companies go into the black, from the red to the black. That's when they make a profit. And so Paul, the accountant, opens up the ledger of his life and he's looking and he's pleased with all the black, all the profit, and increasing ever more in his profit, more than all of his colleagues. And then something happens. And then as he's increasing that profit on the road to Damascus, something happens, doesn't it? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And you remember, Saul loses his sight. Saul loses his sight. He was blinded. And then he was saved. And Jesus gives Paul his vision back. And so, what does Paul do? He, well, he pulls out the same ledger, and he opens it up, and he realizes he was colorblind. That whole time when he was adding into the, the black, adding into the prophet, it was in the wrong column, and it was all red, and it was all loss. It was all damaging to him. 
He was infinitely deep in the red, infinitely deep in debt. In fact, worse than just being a loss, the idea behind this word elicits great harm. So you could say at any moment, the great creditor, God, could call in his debts and Paul would have been internally ruined, completely undone. So Paul declares bankruptcy, sells himself to Christ for a profit, for a gain. You know, Matthew 16, 26, verse 25 or 24, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit? Now that word profit is probably better rendered benefit. What will it benefit a man if he gains? That's our same word here. If he profits, it's another. it's the accounting term. What will it benefit a man if he profits, gains the whole world? He's got the whole world in his ledger, in the black. But he forfeits. It's our same word for loss. He loses his soul. You see, the earthly ledger book and God's ledger book are flip-flopped. They're in opposition to one another. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Paul believed these words enough, these words of Christ, to base the entirety of his life on them. What will it profit? What will it profit? What gain will you have if you have the whole world? but you forfeit your soul. Paul believed these words enough to base the entirety of his life on them. Do you? Do you believe the words of Christ? Or do you dabble here and there in trying to acquire the world? Maybe not all of it, you just want your own slice. Well, Paul continues in verse 7. He says, what is the reason why Paul would do this? What is the reason why he would say all of those things that were gains to me, I've counted as harmful loss Well, for the sake of Christ, literally because of Christ. It is Christ. This is the motivation behind the major shift in what Paul considered valuable in his life. Well, what do you mean, Paul? Aren't you, Paul, aren't you being a, a bit dramatic? I mean, those are good things. Those are good things that you were doing. Those were good things that you had. I mean, I mean, aside from, you know, killing people and persecuting the church in that regard, that wasn't good. But, but all of the other stuff, it's not bad stuff. God blessed you with those things, Paul. Those were God's gifts to you. You shouldn't give them up. Well, let's see how Paul elaborates on this statement in the following verses. Let's look at verse 8 together. More than that. This is is a unique phrase only used a handful of times in the New Testament. What Paul's doing is he's, he's ramping things up with this emphatic reinforcement of his previous statement. Paul's doubling down. And then every phrase that Paul is using in this short section of Philippians is pregnant with significance. He says, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Now, Paul, there's the question is, Paul, your your conversion was 30 years ago. We know that you had a dramatic life change. Okay, that's obvious. But what we want to know is, do you still have that same commitment? If you could go back and change anything, Paul, what would you do? Would you change it? I mean, Paul, you had status. You had the job you wanted. 
You had fame. You had popularity. You had money. You had all of those things that go with it too. At what cost did you lose it? You've been disowned by your family, disowned by your entire community. Wouldn't you at least like to have kept some of it? Wouldn't it have been useful? It would have been useful for ministry, wouldn't it, Paul? Was it really all loss? I mean, Paul, look at you. You don't look good. You're working more hours for a lot less pay. Is it worth it? Well, you'll notice in verse 7, he says, I have counted, and that was happening in the past, and he's saying it's still continuing up to the present. And when he doubles down here in verse 8, he say, I count, this is present, I am still counting all things. So more than even I was before when I first did that. I am counting all things. And he's, he's increased now, it's not just whatever, it's everything. Everything is a loss. Paul doubles down and reinforces his views. I considered it all loss then, and I still continue to consider it all harmful. Paul moves from his focus in the past and his use of whatever. I have counted whatever. I presently count all things. We need to see that. Because Paul, when he's surveying the past life, that he's lived in service to Christ. There was no other place he would rather be than what he is doing for Christ other than in his presence because to die is gain. Paul's saying here, this was no impulsive act. I counted the cost of discipleship. And you know what? I chose the right path. Paul's initial commitment to Christ has only deepened with time. Because notice how he increases his argument. Because in the verse 7, he says, because of Christ. Now in verse 8, he says, it's all loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. All things, anything that even in the slightest hindered Paul's pursuit of Christ. Anything that hindered his prayers, anything that hindered his meditating on the word, anything that hindered his love for and fellowshipping with the saints, the church, anything that hindered his love for God, anything that hindered his love for others, anything that hindered his holiness, and the list goes on and on and on. All things and the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. And we know that this knowing isn't just this mere intellectual knowledge. He's not just saying, there's a box that has to be checked. Yeah, I met that guy. Yeah, I got his autograph. He signed my t-shirt. I'm good to go. No, knowing Christ is salvation. Knowing Christ is salvation. This is relationship. Paul pulls out his scale, and he's placed Christ on one side and literally everything else on the other side. And the picture is as if he laid a block of steel on one side of the scale and a bag full of feathers on the other. This knowledge is not in the way in which you and I know Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. No, this this is more deeper and more intimate. This is the knowledge more so than you have with your spouse. It's more than that. And Paul knows that this knowledge is a promise of the new covenant that is made available only for partakers in that new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 34. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, Know Yahweh, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them declares Yahweh. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. This is a surpassing value. And Paul gets really intimate here because he says, this is Christ Jesus, my Lord. He's mine. 
He's, he's thrusting forward that personal relationship that he has with Jesus. And while we see the concept of Jesus as Savior is implicit in the context, in the names of Christ, Jesus, Yahweh saves, and Christ, he is the long-awaited Messiah, Jesus Christ as Lord, in all caps, is explicit. Now, what's he doing here? Well, if you turn over your page to Philippians 2, he's, he's pulling off, he's been building this argument, and he's pulling a lot from chapter 2, verses 1 and following. Well, let's look at 9. Verse 9, For this reason also God highly exalted Christ and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul saying, yeah, I'm doing that. I've done that by God's grace as a humble worshiper. God has highly exalted Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Have you? Loved ones, have you? What place does Christ have in your life? Is he exalted? Is he the header on every page of your life? Or is he some end note tucked far away? You can find him if you need to. To Christ, no one comes into con contact with Christ and is not changed. For some, he is an aroma of life to life, and for others, from death to death. But this one scene, that all of us will be present, all of us who are here on Zoom right now, and, and who will hear the words of my voice over the internet, all of us will all be present together. And we will all bow the knee and we will all hear the whole of creation cry out, Jesus Christ is Lord. But the question is, will you do it out of love as a humble worshiper? Like Paul is doing here. Tears filling your eyes. Oh, my Lord and my God. Like Thomas said. Or will you do it as a conquered enemy? Gritting through your teeth, as it were. At times like these, we read these passages, and it's easy for us to brush over them, but is Christ really Lord of your life? I mean, what, that, that means that you're a slave. This is a master-slave relationship here. Do you really submit your life to him? Not begrudgingly, but out of the joy of your heart, because you know that he cares for you. Paul takes... Intense personal comfort and security in this fact that Christ is his Lord. Do you? Now, for him to be Lord of your life means that he is supreme over your will. Supreme over your affections. Supreme over your desires. Do you submit all of those things to Christ Jesus? Or do you harbor just a little bit for yourself? Paul, Paul goes even deeper still. There's, there's a deep affection and a rich devotion here in Paul's words. And notice what he says. Chapter 3, let's continue. He says, My Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, or because of whom, Christ, it's because of my Lord, I have suffered the loss of all things. This is the verb form of that word loss that we've already seen a couple times. Paul keeps repeating it and, and broadening and deepening this. Paul's looking back to his conversion and the time surrounding it to advance his argument one more time. You know, Paul lost his good name. Paul lost a, a cush job. Paul lost his elite status. Paul lost his earthly inheritance. Paul lost his friends. Paul lost his comfortable lifestyle. Paul lost his physical and financial security. Paul forfeited everything. Everything. <laughs> he goes even further. And he says, and count them but rubbish. 
And again, this is a verb. This is in the present. And I am counting it. Day after day, whenever I think of that, rubbish, garbage. And for us, some of us, that kind of boggles our mind. You had a cush job. You, you were taken care of for the whole of your life. You didn't have to worry about money. You didn't have to worry about anything. How could you say that's all garbage? Well, it's actually more than garbage. More than just the removal of harmful loss in the ledger of his life, Paul repudiates these things. These glorious claims of righteousness found in law-keeping? No. The prized possessions of status and comfort? No. All of these things that he worked for and looked forward to in his life, when viewed with the pure eyes of discipleship of Christ, discipleship to Christ, he recognizes their filth. Actually, if we're going to translate this literally, the word for rubbish is quite crude. It's, it's not used anywhere else. Uh, lexically, it would read, it's all crap. It's a strong word. A crude and emphatic way of expressing human excrement. And he says all of that is filth. So that I may gain Christ. So that I may gain, so that I may profit Christ. Paul consistently sees all of these former prophets as rotten table scraps at best in comparison with the continuous all-satisfying feast that is Christ Jesus, his Lord. And we have to pause and we have to consider in our own lives. How, loved ones, how do you leverage your life for Christ? How do you leverage your life for Christ? Notice that Paul doesn't say, you know what? I'm willing to count all things as loss. He doesn't say that, does he? He says, I have counted all things as loss and I do count all things as loss. This isn't hypothetical for Paul and it shouldn't be for us either. It's all worse than loss. It's unspeakable filth. Paul takes all of that stuff that maybe some of you look forward to and you prize the things that Paul had. He takes them and he flushes them down the toilet. J.I. Packer explains this truth memorably. And I quote, When Paul says he counts the things he lost rubbish or dung, he means not merely that he does not think of them of having any value, but also that he does not live with them constantly in his mind. What normal person, now listen to this, what normal person spends his time nostalgically dreaming of manure? Yet this, in effect, is what many of us do. It shows how little we have in the way of true knowledge of God. I'm going to read that part one more time. When Paul says he counts the things he lost, rubbish or dung, he means not merely that he does not think of them as having any value, but also that he does not live with them constantly in his mind. What normal person spends his time nostalgically dreaming of manure? Yet this, in effect, is what many of us do. It shows how little we have in the way of true knowledge of God. And what about you, Christian? What about you? Do you love to daydream about manure and try and dress it up and pretend like it's something that it isn't? Or do you joyfully organize each aspect of your life with the goal of gaining Christ? Christ. 
That's it. That's my aim. That's the chief. Gaining Christ. Whatever I can do, whatever I can lose, whatever I can put off, so I can gain Christ. And I'm not talking about in this this monk kind of fashion that we have in America. Not this American monk fashion where you organize your time around your individual quiet time. No, no, that is not biblical Christianity. That is glorified selfishness. Is your life organized to promote communion with God, fellowship with God's people around God's word, ministering to the saints, seeing Christ grow in them, and reaching out to the world to call the elect to Christ? If this is your life, praise God. Press on still more. And if this is not your life, then you are grasping far too tightly to the world and to the flesh. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or consider what Paul says in Galatians 6. But may it And never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. That's it right there. The world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The only thing this world has for me is the basic necessities so that I may gain more of Christ and call others alongside while I'm doing that. That's it. Well, Paul doesn't stop here at the, at the end of verse 8. The same thought is continuing into verse 9. He says, So that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Just as Christ was found in human form, as Paul explains in chapter 2, Paul wants to be found in Christ. Paul wanted Christ at his conversion. Paul wants Christ now. And Paul wants Christ on that day in the future. I want to be found in him, he says, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. Paul doesn't trust any former manner of his law keeping. Nor does he trust in his considering all things as lost. It is all manure. He doesn't want anything like that because he knows that it's not a true righteousness. And he says, this is what I want. But that, that righteousness, which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, all Paul's hope, all of Paul's righteousness comes from Christ and is found in Christ. He, just like they threw all the cargo off the ship in Acts 27, Paul jettisons everything in his life, except for Christ and his righteousness. You know what this is, friends? This is nothing less than justification by faith alone. Justification by faith alone. Although the term repentance is not used here, it is illustrated vividly. He's casting off his former manner of life so that he might have Christ. We we see 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see that great exchange. He takes our sin. We take his righteousness. Paul is saying, this is it. This is life. The righteousness is on the basis of faith. Now this is important. You need to recognize that the object of your faith will be the basis of your righteousness. Yes, he says here, through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, but the object of that faith will be the basis of your righteousness. If you are trusting in your works and you're saying, well, you know, I'm a good person, you may be from your own standard. But friends, none of us are from God's standard. And he's not going to ask us, you know, how would you like to judge yourself this day? He's going to judge us according to his word. 
according to the law. Who can stand on that day? None of us. If we have sinned, we will have an eternity in hell. Just think about it. The one whom you sin against increases the penalty. If I, if I got in a fight outside of my house with my neighbor, that's one crime. If I go and I punch a police officer, do you think the penalty is going to be the same as getting in a fight with my neighbor? If I punch the judge, do you think it's going to be the same penalty as punching a police officer? If I punch the president, same penalty as a judge? You see how when the office increases, so does the penalty. Friends, how much more the office of God than any other human office and the eternality of his being and the fact that the wages of sin is death. And if you die without Christ, you will continue to sin even in hell. This is a glorious day because this is the day when the gates of heaven have been flown wide open and God is pouring out his mercy on the earth so that you, you, yes, you can have this same righteousness that Paul is talking about here. And he says that how to get it right here too, it's faith in Christ. You have to repudiate all your old works. You have to repudiate all the things that you trusted in and you have to grab hold of Christ. Now you have to grab hold of Christ with open hands. You can't be taking your things with you. There's so much of Christ to grab. And the beautiful thing is, when you come to him in faith, turning from your sin, he's actually grabbing hold of you. And though you may fail, and though you may stumble, if he's truly grasped you, you will not fall away. And for you, Christian, I encourage you at this point right now, where you're seated, to examine yourself. How do I know if I'm having a righteousness of my own or this righteousness that comes from God? Well, let's, let's diagnose that. Do you live as if your acceptance before God depends on your obedience? Do you live as if your acceptance before God depends on your obedience? This is trusting in yourself for righteousness. This is law-keeping. This is not the righteousness that is found through faith in Christ. Do you have a tendency in your heart to look down on less obedient believers? Do you have a tendency in your heart to look down on less obedient believers? This is pride based upon trusting yourself for your righteousness. This is pride based upon trusting in yourself for your righteousness. Do you constantly see your sinfulness and question your standing before God, wondering if he can accept you in light of your sinfulness? This is trusting in yourself for righteousness. All of those things are trusting in yourself for your righteousness, not the righteousness that comes by faith in Christ. The object of of your faith will be the ground of your righteousness. And if you are trusting in yourself, you, you have no ground. You need to jettison that immediately. You must taste the sufficiency of Christ and be satisfied in Him. You must grasp hold of Christ and be satisfied in Him. And then ask yourself this question, is Christ's work sufficient? Is Christ's work sufficient? Do his works of a perfect life, sacrificial death and, death and, and living resurrection, resurrection do, do these things waver? Do his works ever waver? No. Then why should your faith waver? Is not Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? So then why should your faith change? Because the object of your faith holds fast. And so we too must hold fast. 
And when you sin, ask yourself this question. Is Christ still seated? When you sin, is Christ still seated? Well, friend, if you're in Christ, that sin is forgiven. You just call out to him and ask him to forgive you. And if you are in Christ, you will be forgiven because his work is still effectual. He had gave the once for all sacrifice. He's not getting up and down, getting up and down. He sat down at the right hand of the father. It's done. It's finished. It's over. What we should have is, as we're looking to our justification, that process of being free from sin and being perfectly righteous, having that credited onto our account, that legal declaration of not guilty and perfectly righteous, looking to our justification should push us toward deeper love, deeper fellowship with Christ, deeper fellowship and love for his body, because the two cannot be separated, his body, the church. Well, friends, we're in luck because Paul does not stop here. As beautiful and as glorious as justification is, notice that Paul moves now towards sanctification. Sanctification. Look at verse 10. He says, That which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death. Oh, you hear the cry of that heart, that I may know him, that I may know him. Paul's rallying back to that surpassing value of knowing Christ and building on that thought by showing his desire and goal to pursue an even deeper relationship with Christ. Do you see where Paul is saying, I'm not content? I'm not content. I'm content with the decision that I made 30 years ago and jettisoning all of that. But I'm never content day after day. I must have more of Christ. In that sense, he's not content. You might say a better word would be complacent. Paul's not complacent. He must have Christ. Paul wants deeper, continuous, growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Not just knowing about him, but knowing Him, experiencing Him, loving Him. There's a difference between knowing about somebody and knowing the person. You can go online and find out just about anything you want about anybody today, and you could say you know about them, but do you know the person? He says, I need to know Him, I need to experience Him, I need to love Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of Of his sufferings. And these two phrases, power of his resurrection, fellowship of his sufferings, are one thought. They're linked together. You cannot have one without the other. Think about that. In Paul's mind, and also that of the Spirit of God, you cannot have one without the other. What is the power of his resurrection? What is this? Sanctification. Sanctification. Turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Now let's look let's look at verse 4. He talks about we being baptized into Christ Jesus, we've been baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him and if you guys recall, we we discussed this passage last Easter. Therefore, we have been buried with him. There's that finality of death, there's a burial through baptism, through immersion into death, so that as just as there's a correlation here, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. That's the power and glory of the Father. So we too might what? In order that we might what? Walk in newness of life. Walk in newness of life. 
This is the power of the resurrection for us now. This is sanctification. Loved ones, are you walking in newness of life? Are you living the resurrection? Because if you are in Christ, you are a new creation in Christ. You are a new creature. Old things have passed away. Yes, you still have this body of death. Yes, there's still sin in your members. Uh, But you have a new heart. You have a new soul. You have been changed. You're no longer a slave to sin if you're in Christ. You're a slave to righteousness. You're no longer a sinner by nature if you're in Christ. You are a holy one. Does your life demonstrate that reality? The power of the resurrection in conjunction with the fellowship of his sufferings. This is living out the resurrection. Well, an obvious question here is why suffering? What's the significance of that? Well, we need to recognize that it is the fellowship, sufferings, right? The sharing, the partnering in Christ's sufferings. And these are the things that mold us into Christ's image and prove our familial bond. You look at Romans 8, 17. You can note it down or turn there. I'll read it. Romans 8, 17. I'll start at 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. This is a great time for us to take stock of our lives. Are you suffering for Christ right now? My prayer is that your answer would be yes. Because that is a healthy sign. That is a healthy sign. Sanctification is suffering. Sanctification is suffering. Not all suffering is sanctification. But sanctification is suffering. Christ learned obedience through suffering. And is a servant greater than his master? No. Or far worse. But we've been changed. We have this newness of life. We have this ability to pursue Christ in love now. To walk in newness of life. We as a community of Christ are to be united in the fellowship just within this one book. There's three aspects of this fellowship that we need to recognize. In Philippians 1.5, we are to have the fellowship united together in the gospel. In Philippians 2.1, we are to be united in the spirit. And here in 3.10, in the sufferings of Christ. The sufferings of Christ. Through this suffering, we are united to Christ and also to one another because Christ is not separate from his body, right? I mean, I'll just repeat it. From weeks prior, what did Jesus say to Paul on the Damascus Road? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? Why are you persecuting my brother? Why? No. Why are you persecuting me? Though we can't see Christ in the flesh right now, we see him in his word and with his people. Through this suffering, we're united to Christ and to one another. Not not participating in Christ's once-for-all sacrifice. That is not what's in view here. But being conformed into his image. Being conformed into his image. Being conformed, as the text says, to his death. Paul's goal was to be like Christ. Christ died to free us from sin and its power. And so we, too, need to keep our aim to die to sin and to live to righteousness. We're not adding to Christ's once-for-all sacrifice, but we're living out the implications of it. Our life is not our own. 
As Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. We are to live for God, for Christ, and for others. Guys, our, our, our lives must be marked by a focus on the glory of Christ and his work as we seek to love God and love others, cultivating a life of discipleship. What we've been looking at, Paul looks back at the justifying work of Christ that's applied by faith as the ground on which he's to be found in Christ. Not because of anything that he's done, all because of what Christ has done. And then he says here that, that his desire to grow in a relationship with Christ and his body is the means of sanctification. So you have justification as the basis, sanctification as what Paul is working out by the grace of God and the power of the Spirit. And let's look at verse 11. Paul keeps before him glorification. All of this, and I wish we had time to go deeper and deeper still into this because this is a beautiful passage of Scripture. But let's just look at verse 11. He says, and the resurre- that I may know him, the power of his resurrection and fellowship of his sufferings. Remember, that's one complete thought, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul recognized a direct link between our conformity to Christ's death in our lives and being raised with Christ on that last day. You can't miss that. You're not going to have one without the other. If we are not dying daily with Christ today, we should not expect to be raised with him tomorrow. That's not going to work. If we do not pursue Christ daily unto death, there will be no glorification. Not because we're adding to it or not because we're working it out, but because our lives are the testimony of the fruit, showing the fruit of the root that we actually have within us. So with that in mind, I have another question for you. Do you long for this suffering? Not for the suffering itself, but for what it produces and who the fellowship is with. Do you long for this suffering? You ever go through your Christian life and wonder why Jesus seems so distant from you? Why it seems like he's so far away? Maybe it's because Christ has traveled the road of suffering. And you looked at that road and you didn't want to go. You were unwilling to travel that road with him. And what does that tell you about yourself? You desire comfort more than Christ. You haven't caught up to Paul. You haven't caught up to bit Christianity 101 and justification that he's talking about here. You desire comfort more than Christ. You desire comfort more than Christ's body, the church. Let me help you rethink that as you're looking at this so that you can actually think about this accurately. And let me do that by asking you a question. What makes heaven heaven? It's that Christ is there, right? Heaven is heaven because Christ is there. There's the comfort. There is the peace. So how much more would your comfort and peace be in the midst of suffering if you were walking with Christ than holding back, than holding back for the comfort that is just fake comfort without Christ now? Heaven is heaven because Christ is there. And wouldn't you rather suffer with Christ than to be comfortable in this world without him. There is no comfort like the comfort of God. And if you've been through some serious trials in your Christian walk, and you've been comforted by God through another brother or sister, you know that. 
You know that. And even those worst times of suffering, but suffering in Christ and for righteousness are far better than all the empty shadows of this earth. So what things are you not willing to give up to have more of Christ? What things are you not willing to give up to have more of Christ, which includes more of his people? Because again, they're not separate. Not in that regard. What things are you not willing to give up to have more of Christ and his body? Those are your idols. Those are your idols. You know what they are. At least you know some of them right now. The Lord's been faithful to reveal them to you. And so now it comes down to, will you harden your heart in rebellion and grieve the Spirit of God? Or will you say, bring the suffering on as long as I'm with Christ? Those are the things that will keep you from Christ and his kingdom if you do not forsake them now. You will fall away if you do not forsake them. You see, the resurrection is crucial for our justification. The resurrection gives us the life and strength we need for the day-to-day sanctification. The resurrection is also the hope of our glorification. And all of this comes from knowing Christ and his sufficient work, not our own, but faith in his sufficient work. So I want to ask you, do you live out the resurrection? Do you glory in the resurrection? And I'm not just talking about Passion Week. I'm not just talking about Good Friday, Easter Sunday. I'm talking about every day. Do you live out the resurrection and the implications with regard to your justification, your sanctification, and your glorification? You pray with me. Father, Lord, let us be a people that are always looking to Christ. Let us be a people that would rather suffer with Christ than to be without him. Let us be a people that put no stock in the flesh, no stock in the things of this earth, no stock in ourselves, but let our faith be holy, completely, and purely on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his perfect, effectual work. We thank you and we praise you for the work that Christ has done, his perfect life, and his sacrificial death, and in his resurrection from that death, proving the claims that he made and that you accepted the sacrifice, Father. And there is hope for us all in Christ and in him alone. So let us glory. Let us glory in this beautiful Savior, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen.